Well, Pope Francis is still going strong, but he's not a young man. And eventually his time here on earth will be at an end. When that happens, what will the next Pope face in wake of this controversial pontiff? That's what we're going to talk about today on Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host, editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Just want to encourage people to smash that like button, to subscribe to the channel, follow us on social media, subscribe to our news, email newsletter, do all the stuff that you're supposed to do that I tell you to do every single time. And by now, if you haven't done it, why are you still listening? So please do it now. So, okay, so we got Charles Cologne today, which is great. I'm very excited about this. He is a contributing editor of Crisis Magazine. That's his most important title of them all. He's the author of a whole bunch of books. My favorite, of course, and your favorite as well, is Blessed Charles of Austria, A Holy Emperor and His Legacy. I am I should have grabbed it so I could hold it up. I, I seriously can see it on my shelf that half the shelf is like Habsburg-related books. And it's all because of your book that I have all the other books because that got me fascinated into it. Grew my devotion to Blessed Carl. And so now I have like a half a bookshelf, which I know is nothing compared to yours, I'm sure, <laughs> on, on the Habsburgs and upon, upon a Blessed Carl. So welcome to the program, though, Charles. Thank you. Great to be here. And before I even get started, we're going to be talking about the next pope, but I, I'm going to ask you beforehand before we are on air, but I want to ask you now so everybody can know you're currently working on a book about the wife of Blessed Carl, about Servant of God Zeta. And I actually read a biography by her that was out of print, been, you know, long, long ago. But could you tell us about that project and kind of where you are and when we can expect that to happen? Well, sure. Uh, I just finished the, uh, I just began the penultimate chapter of the book. So I'm hoping to bring it in within a week or at the tops too. Uh, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, because I'm glad I'm going, but I've got to go to Denmark and England tomorrow and then come back. So I'll be gone. If I weren't leaving, I'm pretty sure I'd be done with the thing in a week as far as the, um, the last two chapters go. But basically, I look at her life. Uh, well, as I did with the Carl book, I give the prequel background information without which you simply can't understand the lady. And that's very, very important because she lived her life as a result of all sorts of occurrences in the past, her past, her family's past, with which most of us are simply not familiar. And if you don't understand the dynamics at work with her in terms of her background, you can't understand the woman as she lived her life. Uh, without wanting to give too much away, suffice to say that she found herself living the stories that she'd been brought up on. I mean, the best way I can, I can epitomize this for you is if, imagine that um, you'd heard your grandfather's stories about the trenches in World War I, uh, in the mud and the this and the that. Ugh. And then one day you found yourself a soldier in trench warfare with all the, with everything that, you know, grandpa or great grandpa or whomever talked to you, told you about. It would have a definite effect on you. Right. Um, I also deal, of course, uh, in the last chapter I'll be dealing with the great question, which is why she and her husband are so popular in the United States, which is the country that more than any other single factor destroyed them. Uh, I mean, Lord knows there are a lot of villains in their story. Carl Renner, of course, the worthless trader who sold his country three, if not four times, uh, to different buyers. Of course, you know it's, it's always always best to keep a little bit of a little bit of flexibility going there. Uh, Admiral Horthy, the famous admiral on horseback who broke his oath to the king as he was in Hungary. Uh, Count Chenin, the foreign minister during the war, who betrayed him. Oh, I could go on and on and on. Uh, Cardinal Piffle of Vienna and Cardinal Chernock of Budapest. Oh, yes. whole lot of blame to go around in the Carl and Zeta story. You, you bet. But at the bottom of it all was our very own Woodrow Wilson, without whom none of the others could have done a thing. You, you'll be very happy to, to hear this story that 
in I was giving a talk last year on the feast of uh, Blessed Carl about his life. And when I mentioned Woodrow Wilson, literally when I said the name, there were boos from the audience. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is an educated audience. These people know what they're doing. I was, and I took a pause. I was like, yes, you're right. He is the villain of this story. And so I was just, I was very happy that literally his name mentioned in the context of their, of, of, of their life got boos from the audience. So. Well, yeah, me too. And, and see, that's also very useful because there's been a revolution in writing about the Habsburgs. I'm sure, I'm sure you've noticed. It's not just Catholics writing about uh, Carl and Zita as a Beatrice and a servant of God. There's been a whole revolution in writing about the Habsburgs historically in English, both in the States and in Britain. Uh, as we've passed the century mark from the uh, post-war propaganda, we're able to look at the whole thing honestly. Now, this is still too tender a subject to have slipped into German yet. And so the establishment here is still venerate Karl Renner, hmm. uh, who, I mean, that's very much like theologians still venerating Karl Renner, but that's a whole, <laughs> other, whole, other, whole other story. Uh, but nevertheless, the fact is that the Habsburg entity was an organization that say whatever else, forget your religion, forget this, forget that. It worked. It worked better than anything before or since. And the destruction of it ended in misery and death for thousands, if not millions of people. And it continues to the present day. The echoes of it are going on in Ukraine as we speak. So, I mean, this has been the gift that's kept on giving. I, I will say, though, that I have stood beside the tombs of Blessed Carl in Madeira, of Servant of God Zita here in Vienna, and of Woodrow Wilson at the National Cathedral in Washington. I only prayed by two of them. I'm not telling you which one. Yes, we'll have to guess which two of the three you prayed by. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's move on to our subject. So anyway, so people should be excited about this book coming no, out. I, I know I am. Uh, do you I, think it will be out in 2024 or do you think it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm, I, I certainly, I mean, I, I don't know for sure. I certainly hope so. It, um, you know, I was delayed. I had a, a uh, last year at this time, I had some very, very bad health problems and mm. uh, they're gone. Now. I mean, it was completely fixed, but I um, almost snuffed it to put it uh, nicely um but then so i'm here despite everyone's best efforts so my must want you to write this book then yeah that's what i figured but it did delay it considerably yeah. uh, by considerable time is it going to be a tan publication? yes okay very good this is a tan book um unfortunately i mean the the, the man jason gates who's my editor is is a fine fellow but I have to admit, I uh, I very much miss the late lamented uh, John Morehouse, who oh, right. uh, was my editor and guided both the Grail book, the Holy Grail book, and Kaiser Karl through the process. I had uh, I had worked with John before in other other venues, and uh, yeah, his death was a real kick in the head. It, so, it's interesting. I did not know him, but it's interesting how his name has popped up many times in conversations over the past year or so um just like he did this you know he was in it just like you know yeah sounds sounds amazing so that was a, de a definite loss he, yeah he was an amazing guy he was only 51 yeah you know left behind a wife and uh, some kids and just a all-around great fellow i mean you know so but anyway i as my late father used to say uh, god takes the good ones leaves us <laughs> that's right uh, it does seem to be the way speaking of which not taking somebody uh let's talk about pope francis <laughs> hey, like that segue <laughs> well that's that's what i call a segue all right <laughs> that's right so the pope is not a young man we're not here praying for his early demise or anything like that we're just simply stating we know uh the body can only last so long. He, 86, 87, I can't remember exactly, but you know, yep. he's he's up there in years and he's definitely have health problems. I mean, most of the time he's in a wheelchair when he's out in public and uh 
various health problems. So it's going to be before too long, you know, in the next year, next two years, five years, whatever, that he's going to um, go to his reward such that it is. And so the question then becomes the next Pope. Now, I would like, before we get into kind of looking forward, I have you listed there as a historian on the screen, which means that makes you, that means you are. If I say that on the screen, it must be true. Okay. Um, okay. I'll try to live up to it. So the, let's talk a little bit of, though about the process of electing a new Pope and particularly I, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the messy nature and the political nature? We want to, I think Catholics want to have this idea of the Holy Spirit basically uh, is there and everybody's praying and fasting and then they, the Holy Spirit tells them, elect this man and then he's elected. But I think history tells us something different. Can you just give us a, a little bit of an insight on how papal elections have been throughout history and kind of the, the process that, that happens? Well, it's been a very complex process and it didn't jump from the uh, from the head of Zeus, like Athena did, uh, the uh, selection of popes. The first pope, Saint Peter, uh, chose his successor, Saint Linus. Uh, that was the only time that happened. For a long time, the uh, popes were chosen. Remember, as bishops of Rome, they were primarily subject to the people and the clergy of Rome. And so they were elected by the people in clergy of Rome. From time to time, either the Byzantine or the Holy Roman Emperor would select one, a pope, I mean, or confirm them. Um, as time went on, the uh, and the the day-to-day -day universality of the office grew. Uh, the custom arose of even allowing other bishops to be elected Bishop of Rome. This was kind of a new deal. They didn't do it until the late 700s. And the first one to be so elected was a man called Formosus. And later on, his uh, because his uh, political sponsors were opponents of the uh, lady that engineered the election of his successor, Stephen VI. Stephen VI had his body dug up and had the famous uh, cadaver synod, in which he declared that A, because Formosus had been Pope of another city, he had never been validly Bishop of Rome. And as I like to say, if that were true, the state of Acantus missed the bus a long time ago. <laughs> a long, long time ago. But the second is even more interesting because he claimed that because he had never validly been Pope, all of his sacramental ministrations were invalid. Now, the problem with that is that that judgment itself is heretical right. and was heretical by the standards of the day. But you know how it is. If you're in charge, you make the rules. And who's going to say you're wrong? Well, this got a lot of confusion going, of course, because he'd ordained and consecrated a lot of priests and bishops. So they were all tossed out. But then Stephen died. Uh the rival group came in again, and the next pope said, no, no, just kidding, just kidding. He's really, he was really pope and so on. But then, and this is when you're speaking of papal selections, this is probably the worst way to do it. Much worse than having the emperor do it. Much worse than having the people and clergy of Rome do it. And that is having the most powerful women in Rome choose their husbands or what well, are husbands, uh, uh, lovers or sons by those lovers to be Pope. Personally, I don't think that's a good way. Very feminist. Yeah. I mean, it's women power. All right. No doubt about it. The Iron Age of the, of the papacy, the pornocracy it was called, was definitely the triumph of woman power. I'm no way around that. But it, it introduced almost 100 years of horror and chaos into the papacy, which oddly enough was not noticed or didn't bother the East, the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Hmm. There wasn't a problem then. Finally, the Holy Roman Emperor, Otto the Great, had had enough of it. He came south to get crowned Pope to Rome. He sees what's going on, and he forcibly 
reforms the papacy, which is kind of easy to do if you've got an army behind you. You know, right. I've often believed that we wouldn't have had the Council of Trent if it hadn't been for the sack of Rome in 1527. Kind of wakes you up. Yeah. You know, when people are taking your stuff and smacking you around, you, you kind of, I don't know. It focuses. It helps. Anyway, uh, from that time on, after the Iron Age was, uh, the Iron Age of the Papacy was ended, uh, slowly but surely, the uh, electorate became uh, became concentrated in the cardinals. Now, bear in mind who these cardinals were originally. They were the cardinal bishops, who were the bishops of the local sees, the suburbicarian sees, as they call them. I love that name. Uh, they, uh, the cardinal priests, who were the uh, basically the pastors of the biggest parishes in Rome, and the cardinal deacons, who were the heads of the diaconal districts into which Rome was divided. Uh, in time, most of them became bishops, which are all three. And you had the emergence in order to um, in order to staff offices that needed bishops in the charge, you had the uh, uh, emergence of the titular diocese and so on, which we're familiar with. But at any rate, that was how the, the cardinals as the voting block emerged, because they were, uh, they were in fact, uh, clergy of the city of Rome, or the diocese of Rome, which incidentally is still true. That's why when a, uh, you've got, say, a very bad cardinal in a given diocese, and his successor wants to punish him, he can't. His predecessor is a priest of the, of the Diocese of Rome, hmm. answerable only to the Pope. And that, believe it or not, has come up in the uh, past in the past few years under this pontificate. Uh, I don't want to name names like Cardinal Mahoney, but suffice it to say that this is how such people have gotten away from being uh, disciplined by their successors. Right. Anyway, uh, eventually the conclave grew up. And this was done uh, to keep the cardinal electors from being uh, influenced unduly by outside influences. One of the um, important outside influences, however, that was permitted for a long time, until 1903, was the liberum veto, the, 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 the right of exclusion of a cardinal given to various Catholic heads of state, the Holy Roman Emperor, the King of France, the King of Spain. Now, this didn't mean they could veto the Pope once he was elected. What it meant was that if there was a particular candidate that the Emperor or one of those two kings did not want to see as Pope, if it looked like he was going to be elected, then they could drop the veto and say no. Anybody else, not him. And it could only be done for one individual, the right of exclusion, only one person. So its most recent um, its most recent exercise was in 1903 at the conclave that uh, gave us St. Pius X. It looked like the election was going to go to Cardinal Rampola, the really awful Secretary of State of Leo XIII. Well, Franz Josef uh, of Austria had the Archbishop of Krakow uh, exercise the veto against him. So that's why we got St. Pius X. You can thank Emperor Franz Josef for that. Anyhow, um, as the years went by, the rules of the conclave became ever more vigorous. There was one period when I think it was a year or two or three that the conclave went on and on and on in, a, in the papal palace in Viterbo because in those days, it was the custom that you would have the conclave wherever the Pope died. And so the Pope was on vacation at the palace in Viterbo. He dies, and there they are in Viterbo. They're away from Rome. They're having a good time. They're enjoying themselves. It's great. Why hurry? We'll get to the vote eventually. Yeah, sooner or later, not a problem. Well, after several years went by, the mayor of Viterbo and the, and the townspeople got a little tired of it. So they took the roof off the palace and exposed the cardinals to um, the sun and the rain. 
believe it or not, within a few days, they had a candidate. It was very strange. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you've had some elections go terribly awry uh, after the Babylonian captivity of the church when the uh, papacy moved back at last to Rome. Uh, they had a conclave, but the French cardinals declared that they had been uh, pressured by the mob outside. So they went back to France and elected another pope. So now you had two. And as the schism went on, eventually a number of cardinals got tired of it. So they went to the town of Pisa, elected a third. So now you have three popes. And the only way it was solved, once again, was when the Emperor Sigismund, the Holy Roman Emperor, said, you know, uh, Christendom has suffered three popes long enough. I think we're putting an end to it now. And he gathered the cardinals at Constance, and he had them elect a new pope, who was Martin V. He didn't choose him. But sometimes these people need a little bit of outward help, a little assistance. The, the vocation of the laity in accord with Vatican II, as you might say. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, the conclave system that we know has been going for several hundred years. And by and large, it works as well as anything else. Right. I think one thing that Catholics underestimate is the role of acceptance in the election of a pope or the uh, deposing of a pope. And by that, I mean, it's especially Western, like American types. We have this, I, a very strict legalistic view of how things are. Okay. You follow these rules and, and then you get the result. If you don't follow these rules then it's an invalid result. Yeah. But if you look at how the, and the rules are that no one can judge the Pope, uh, an emperor is not above a Pope. The rules are that the election has to go X, Y, and Z or else it's invalid. But what if you look at history, and this is what I mean about kind of the messiness of it, you'll see where essentially the acceptance of a pope by the church, basically everybody, not in the, every individual, but generally by the leaders and by the lady, that is an acknowledgement this is the pope. So when Otto has no real authority in canon law to depose a pope, but when he basically tells a pope, you're gone. We need somebody else. And the whole oh. church says, yeah, we agree with that. Then all of a sudden we have a new Pope. And, no, I, I, and you have the sense of Fidelium. I mean, it's like Silverius and Vigilius, you know, Vigilius engineered Silverius's overthrow. Uh, but he ended up getting accepted as rightful Pope anyway. Right. And of course, to be honest, he did clean up his act considerably, but uh, you know, these things are messy. And because we would like to think they aren't, we kind of set them aside and put them back in history and put them to bed and pretend they never happened. But, you know, uh, the, the downside, of course, is that we have no Otto. We have no Sigismund. We have no Charles V. We have sleepy Joe Biden. <laughs> I mean, he's there. But I, I think it applies, though, in the in the discussions about the last conclave that you'll see some people argue from canon law they didn't follow this this and that therefore it's an invalid conclave and so francis isn't really the pope but the fact is is that francis has been accepted as pope yeah. by the church i know not necessarily by certain elements of twitter or whatever but <laughs> by all the cardinals and the bishops and the laity they all yeah. basically acknowledge francis as pope and that fact alone essentially makes it that he's a valid pope because well, they don't, accept it. Don't forget that after Benedict died, a certain number of Bene Vacantes, as they call them, uh, had a conclave in Rome and duly elected Pope Francis. Yeah, I thought that was that was highly ironic. I, I, it, I mean, everybody's expecting them to vote themselves and they vote for Francis. I'm like, <laughs> OK, well, they got there eventually. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, uh, it was an old, old, old joke that St. Vicantism is wishful thinking. And I think there's a certain amount of truth to it. Of course, I, I have to say, I, I knew uh, one of the biggest St. Vicantists in the States, the late and much lamented uh, Hutton Gibson, 
who was a state of accountants with a very, very keen sense of humor. And so after the current Holy Father was elected, I said to him, you know something, Red? You, you state of accountants, you are pretty tricky. What are you talking about? What an amazing tactic. No one saw it coming. What are you talking about? Getting one of your own elected pope. That was just amazing. I, my hat's off to you. <laughs> so he, he lost it. He laughed pretty hard at that point. Yeah. So let's talk then about, we've talked about the past conclave stuff. I want to talk about the next conclave, whenever it may be, kind of what situation is Francis leaving for the next pope? What, what, what challenges is he going to face? Like, just let's talk about that generally. Like, what do you think the next pope, he is probably the biggest challenges that he has to face once he becomes elected? Well, that depends on what it is he wants to do. I mean, Francis has spoken of himself very, very happily as possibly going down in history as the man who split the church. You know, and if that's your idea of a good time, well, then I'm sure the next pope will attempt to continue in his footsteps. But let's pretend we get a pope who would like to save souls. I know it's an ironic concept. We, we don't talk about it. We don't really believe in it much as Catholics anymore. As Pope Benedict said, the vast majority of Catholics are universalists. And when that's the case, then really none of it matters at all. It doesn't even matter if you put money in the collection plate or the church goes bankrupt and has to sell everything. It doesn't really matter, does it? Right. Because after all, you don't need the church to save souls. But let's pretend for a second we get a pope who doesn't think that. He's going to have a lot on his plate. Because first and foremost, in a very real sense, I'm sorry to say the Holy Father has destroyed a lot of the moral credibility of the office. Now, I know that we should all be wise enough to separate the man from the office. And actually, objectively speaking, absolutely. You bet. We really need to be. And, and that's true of Catholics at any time, any period whether the Pope is uh, uh, St. Pius V or uh, Julius III, who was a very modern Pope and would have, he, I mean, he'd have loved a grinder account. He would fit in beautifully. But that's all on one side. The reality of the situation is that for an awful lot of people, the credibility of the Catholic Church is all bound up with the personality of the sitting Pope. It shouldn't be that way. Life should be wonderful. Everything should be perfect, but it's not. So um, he's going to have to be, I think, carry himself very well, be a very courteous individual, I'd do what Benedict started doing, which was retaking a lot of the papal paraphernalia. Because you see, what the world needs right now is not Pope Francis or Pope John Paul II or Pope Charles or Pope Eric or Pope Bobby Joe or Pope uh, Billy McGee, with or without Janis Joplin. What the, what the world needs is the Pope. The man in the tiara. The father of kings and princes. The vicar of Christ. The patriarch of the West. Sovereign pontiff of the Universal Church. In other words, we need a pope who can who can uh, subjugate his own personality to the office. We need a pope who's not about him. We need a pope who's about the office, who's about the church, who's about being the vicar of Christ and the successor of Saint Peter. That's, that's the first thing. We need a pope who sees himself as the great bridge builder, the Pontifex Maximus, as the man into whose hands the primary responsibility for the salvation of souls across the planet has been given. If we don't have that, then we'll have more of the same. So that's, that's the first thing. Now, the... the... It seems to me that the, and most observers that the Vatican 
is so highly corrupt right now that most of the high level appointments are just friends of, of Francis who are just wreaking havoc. Uh, I mean, it's, I mean, it's scandal after scandal coming out of the Vatican. And so I know like, isn't, I think there's when a new Pope comes, everybody, all the heads have to submit the resignation. Um, I mean, is the, the, the only way forward to be really successful would be for the Pope basically accept all of them and just say, we're going to start new and just have a, a brand new, uh, Vatican with all new people in it, or is there any way to redeem what we have now? Well, they, see, that's the funny thing because what we have now is not what we had ten years ago. Right. You've got to remember that, in a weird way, the Holy Father has almost opened the door for fixing the process much more quickly than it could have been done before. Traditionally, popes have inherited the machinery they've inherited, and they have very carefully and very judiciously pruned it, added to it, changed it to push it in the direction they wanted to go. But until this pontificate, we never saw wholesale firings and replacements. And now we have. So basically, what you ended up with, you know what the spoils system is. Right. Well, we never had that in the Curia before. We do now. So, yeah, it's going to need to be cleaned, but only in the way that it was dirtied. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I thought at the time when he first started doing these wholesale firings, I said, you know, he's, he's really not doing his minions any favors because he's establishing a precedent that will come up and bite not him, but them. Yeah, because it's interesting because one of the criticisms of John Paul II and Benedict somewhat as well was appointments were not all ideologically in line with no. the Church pontiffs. And I mean, criticism more conservative is like, why did you make Mahoney a cardinal? Why did you, you know, elevate these? Why was McCarrick so high up and, and things like that? I mean, this Pope has made no secret of if you're not his friend, and by friend, meaning you just do whatever he, you, you just go along with anything he says or does, then you don't get a high office. I mean, Cardinal Burke is no longer there. I mean, we saw happen with Cardinal Pell. I mean, just it, it just it, I, I don't know if there's any true uh, like loyal opposition, for lack of a better term, in the Curia anymore. I mean, they, they seem no. to all have been pruned away. Well, um, no, uh, I mean... another example. Uh, well, six is the fifth, but he did did so in a good way. Uh, his election was quite interesting because it was during the uh, Renaissance, just the post-Renaissance period, and there was a lot of pressure on the cardinals to elect a reform cardinal, but they didn't want to. And the man who became six is the fifth came to the conclave on two sticks he, you know, his eyes were all roomy. He looked like he was at death's door. But he had a reputation as a reform cardinal. So they figured, right, we'll elect him. He'll, he's a reform cardinal, no one can complain, and he's obviously at death's doorstep. Well, they elected him. He threw down his sticks. He wiped the goo out of his eyes. He said, now, brethren, we have the papacy and we shall set to work. And they and he did. They didn't appreciate it. I can assure you. He gave the uh, the holders of uh, multiple sees um, twenty four hours to get out of Rome or go to prison. Things like that. Which no. so no, I I I suspect that when next we get a pope who's of uh, apostolic character, in the words of Vladimir Soloviev. Um, He will clean with a new broom. Right. What do you think is most likely as far as the next pope who it will be? And not a person necessarily, but I just mean a personality in the sense of will it be a Francis too? Somebody who continues the project of Francis in much the same way. Will it be somebody who might be sympathetic to Francis, but is more willing to be conciliatory with, with rival factions? Will it be a 
JP the third that will be more like that, or a, or a Pius the thirteenth that's going to go mm -hmm. and, and really clean house. I mean, what do you think is most likely to happen in the next conclave, knowing that none of us really know what what will happen until after it happens? And bearing in mind that I have never never yet correctly predicted the outcome of a conclave in all the years I've been alive. So also bear that in mind. So we'll just know whatever you say will go the opposite. No. <laughs> well, if, if, if I was stupid enough to name a person, I've given up doing that. So I, I yeah. don't do that. Yeah. Anymore. And I don't even mean, cause there, I mean, obviously there's names that get thrown out there and I think those often are silly. Not one person throughout Jorge Borgoglio really in 2013. I mean, nobody, I remember Benedict when, when Ratzinger, they're like, there's no way they'd pick Ratzinger. And yeah. all of a sudden he's he gives old, one he's speech. Too old. And, right. Yeah. He gives one speech and they're like, okay, he's our man. I mean, so I, I think, uh, and of course, JP too, uh, Wutiwa, obviously nobody guessed that. So, but I mean more just like, what do you think the, the Cardinals will be looking for in an expo? Well, there, there are a couple of things. Firstly, I don't think, you may have someone of like mind to Francis, but because he's not the same age and is not trapped in 1968, whoever he is, he is not going to have the same fire in the belly to drag us back into polyester. Right. That's just, a great point. That's a great point. I don't think people realize how much just his age and when he was forming his views impacts, you know, how somebody goes about things. Oh, it's huge. See, the thing is, when I was young, little, in fact, in the immediate wake of Vatican II, every parish seemingly had a priest like the current Holy Father, the Vatican II priest. He wasn't always the pastor, but he didn't need to be because he, he he did what he wanted to do. And if you didn't like it, woo, he'd get all upset and he'd, he'd shriek. And, and uh, I was I was blessed to have a father who knew how to put that kind of person in his place. Right. It was always fun to watch. But you'd be amazed how many people let themselves be stepped on in those days. And that's why in seeing the sorts of things that have occurred during this pontificate, it's not really been that much of a surprise for me because I lived through this. It's like having one of the priests of my childhood as Pope. Right. I, I, I've, I've seen this movie, but when he goes to Pope heaven, uh, the um, you won't find anyone with that kind of fury in him. He may have the same ideas. You may get, God forbid, a Cardinal seepage. Uh, sort of slipping through the rocks. But uh, the other thing is that although he has appointed a number of cardinals with the sorts of creatures he likes having around him, uh, I, I think calling them pervs and criminals is a very unkind thing to say, and I don't think people should say that. But ser seriously, uh they are a minority of his appointments. Most of them are people from obscure seas. Uh, I think appointed primarily to annoy people and, and bishops of larger seas that traditionally would get the red hat. You know, you don't get it, but the bishop of Flatwood Mesa gets it. Right. Well, the you know, that's great if you want to insult that, that major metropolitan, that's fine. You, you've done your job. The problem is you probably don't really know the Bishop of Flatwood Mesa. Right. And he doesn't know you, and he doesn't know the other cardinals. And you're going to have a horde of these uh, rubes from out of town, as they used to say in the big city, uh, descending on Rome for the next conclave. It, it seems like his most ideological opponents to the to the Cardinal are in America, which is because he hates America the most. It's like almost every, every Cardinal he's picked in America is an ideological um, per, uh, uh, ally, which makes, I think Americans think that's what he's doing with every Cardinal appointment. But I think it's mostly restricted here because you see when he picks uh, McElroy, for example, in San Diego, which is a nothing diocese compared. I mean, it, it's, it's subordinate to, uh, Los Angeles and he won't pick Gomez. He didn't pick Chapu. Um, and I think, so I do think in America, we get a little bit of a special of a, treatment. Yeah. Special treatment that makes it skewed that we think all of the Cardinals, I think there's a 120 right now that are electable age or something like that. 
they're all like that. But I think I think what you're saying is true that it, it, that's not that's not true worldwide. It seems to be more true just in America. No, uh, worldwide he tends to choose people from obscure seas, just apparently for their obscurity, and the danger for his side in that is that you know a lot of them may be Catholic. You don't know to some degree or other. And uh, the other thing, too, to remember is that the St. Gallen Mafia isn't with us any longer. Right. They've gone to Cardinal Heaven, as St. John Chrysostom describes it so, so beautifully. Uh, and the, I would not be surprised if at the next conclave, the Burke, Miller, Sarah clique are the best organized. And certainly the most diverse. And if they could convince enough obscurities that the faith needs to be safeguarded and not destroyed, then we may get quite a surprise out of the uh, conclave. But even if we don't, um, whatever we get, even if it's inclined along Francis's path, it's not going to have. I mean, let's 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 take a real nightmare, Cardinal Seepage. All right. Well, what do we know about Cardinal Seepage? We know that when he is faced with a real challenge, he backs down. How do I say this? Well, thanks to trash can custodians. Uh, sorry, traditionis custodians. My mistake. Uh, he forbade the Institute of Christ the King to offer public mass in their own headquarters. So we know he's a petty little person, which, you know, is fine. Nothing wrong with being a petty little person in charge of a large archdiocese. Why should there be anything wrong with that? If religious liberty can't begin with the bishops, why bother having it? <laughs> but, but, notice that when he was going to shut that church down because of the damage, he did that, he, he took them on because he had the Pope behind him. But when he was face to face with their lay and wealthy sponsors, he backed down. So similarly, I am willing to wager that if he were elected Pope, which God forbid, if enough bishops with enough money behind them told him, you know what, Your Holiness, you really want to do this? You get to do it on your own dime, and we'll see how you do it then. And I suspect he'll back down. Yeah, I I feel like there is a, and I, I might just be making this up, but among the Episcopacy, there is a certain uh, fatigue, Francis fatigue, that his, even those who are supportive of his goals, or at least some of them, aren't really a fan of his methods because it makes their life miserable. I mean, just traditionalist custodians is a perfect example. Most of the bishops weren't like huge fans of traditionalists. It's not like they, they were like, hey, let's all have Latin masses. But at the same time, they were happy to just leave them alone and be left alone by them. Just well, have a little mass over there and, and you stay quiet and you donate to the diocese sometimes. We're all, everybody's happy. Now all of a sudden I have to go in and tell them, oh, I'm going to now tick all you people off greatly make my life harder when I have these other pressing issues I care about. And I just feel like that that might be a, 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 a major factor in who they elect for the next one. Well, yeah, I, I mean, don't forget, depending on the diocese, it varies, but in so, a number of dioceses, traditionalists are a major source of income in a post COVID era when the church is being well rewarded financially for all it did for everyone. Yeah. All of that that pastoral care is being paid back. Yep, it's getting paid back what it what it earned. Yep. One of the things that I really um, was struck by during COVID were the number of parishes I knew back home and they would say, make a perfect act of contrition, make a spiritual communion, donate here. Yeah. That, it was just unbelievably 
I remember that so well going to these websites of dioceses and parishes during COVID. Like, yeah, we're all shut down. We're not going to do anything for you, but here's where you can still donate to us. Like the tone deafness of it, that they thought that Catholics would just be like, oh, okay, sure. Of course I'll keep giving to you, even though you've completely, I mean, just from, I know we don't, we're not paying for the sacraments, but the fact is there is a certain understanding of we will pay to keep the church open so that we can continue to go to church. No. <laughs> Well, well so if we I can't mean, continue to go to church. Why should we pay to keep it open? If but the yet, milkman stops bringing milk, do you still send money to the dairy? Right. And I don't think so. You know, there's the the old thing about uh, why why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? Well, why pay for the milk when you're not getting anything? Right. And I think you're right, though. That I mean, I think a lot of people have been saying this for a number of years that you see just the demographics that the more traditionally minded, more con even just conservative minded are the Catholics that are staying and everybody else is leaving. And so eventually you start to, the demographics start, to, demographics start going in our favor. Now, I think for most of us, it's gone way slower than we thought. Francis was not exactly what was expected by a lot of people. But I think COVID did really accelerate that trend where yeah. you just see it in, in a diocese where Look at the parish numbers. The ones that are increasing in number and continuing to give are the traditional Latin Mass parishes or the kind of the unicorn Novus Ordo parishes and which ones are not. And that's everybody else. And so, like you said, the bishop knows this. The bishop sees the numbers. And it's like, why am I trying to tick off the very people who keep who are keeping the doors open in the rest of the diocese? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was really... If I uh, if I may use the phrase "stupid move," and it uh, you know it's funny Cardinal Seurat made a comment about it, which he doesn't generally do, but he did, and he said that it will certainly achieve the opposite of what it's attempting to. Right. Um, and of course, you know the the question was asked in your sister publication, One Peter Five. Uh, it was said that uh, TC hadn't gone anywhere. Several bishops were called in for questioning afterwards, right. whether or not there was a um, whether or not there was a, uh, a causal connection. I couldn't say. But yeah, we even do know there, when we look at the at the uh, statistics, the analytics, there are readers in the Vatican. Of, of but you know. But here's didn't... the thing: even if that were true, even if that were true, you know, my my parents were in Angel Street, the the play that gave us the the name, the the phrase gaslighting. Oh, right, right. Okay. I, I know what gaslighting is. Yeah. I grew up with my parents uh, joking about it constantly. And I'm telling you, blaming trads for not being grateful, for being constantly kicked in the teeth, is not helpful. Yeah. And for that matter, I mean, I, I agree, frankly, that trads could be a lot more helpful in real ways. I mean, I remember when uh, Benedict was inaugurated. I hate that phrase, but that's what he used. When he was inaugurated, I remember I was covering it for ABC News. And I remember his comment, pray for me that I do not flee for fear of the wolves. And I thought, what's he talking about? Where's he going to go? And then when he abdicated, my first thought, first thought was, well, I guess we didn't pray enough. Right. And, you know, he was constantly being sniped at. He's not doing enough. Well, see, and there I could see where people would get annoyed with the trad attitude. Right. But the fact remains, trads did not create this situation. Trads did not surround the Holy Father with pervs and criminals. Trads did not sell out the underground church in China. See, it wasn't trads who did that. Can't blame them for that one. Got to come up with some other patsy. It's, it's... That, that is what's amazing, though, is that traditional Catholics are blamed that they're the they're the barrier to the to the new future great church, yet we have these issues all around us. That I mean, trans are a minuscule part of the church. 
let, let me clue you in on something. I spent most of my youth without any Tridentine mass. From 1966, it was still, quote unquote, the old mass, but by 1966, it looked like the new mass. From 1966 until 1985, I did not see a traditional mass other than Cardinal McIntyre offering it on the side altar at St. Basil's on Wilshire Boulevard. What kept me in the faith were three things. Okay, four. Uh, my parents, Cardinal McIntyre, whom I got to know very well. I was my confessor. The then Romeward bound uh, Anglo Catholics of St. Mary of the Angels, who ended up, some of them becoming what ended up being the prequel to the Ordinariates. And then the Russian Catholics in El Segundo. That was, I mean, my, my Catholic school was horrible. My Catholic parish was horrible. It was awful. Just uh, trance had nothing to do with anything. Right. Most of my classmates in high school leaving the faith had nothing to do with trance. Nothing. Right. It had a lot to do with our textbook, Christ Among Us, which 10 years later, John Paul II uh, ripped the uh, imprimatur from. Oh, yes, that. But I don't, I don't think there were any trance present for choosing that as the major catechetical work on right. the part of the archdiocese. I, I don't know. I, I just don't think so. And I think, I think the average bishop who is, believes that, thinks that too. Like they realize it's not, they, they know trades aren't the enemy. Like they might have be like, yeah, they, they, they have a little bit of an attitude problem at times, stuff like that, but it's such a small number of people. And typically they do relatively just donate and, and keep sh quiet and kind of keep to themselves. Yeah. And they and donate out of proportion of their numbers. Right, right. And, and so I, I think, so, okay, so the question is, let's get back then to the next conclave. I'm going to ask you a question that, you know, I, I was going to ask you a question, what would you do if you were Pope, elected Pope, the first thing you would do? Resign. <laughs> okay. That is the right answer. That is the correct answer. Um. <laughs> So what would you, okay, who do you want to be the next Pope? Like if you could pick out of the, out of the, the, you know, eligible people, who do you think would make a great next Pope? Well, of course, I don't want to jinx them, yeah. but, uh, oh, I'd say Cardinal Sarah. Um, I would get down but, on my knees in Thanksgiving and praise if that happened. Uh, yeah, you know, me too. Well, I mean, I did when Ratzinger got it. I oh, I, I was Actually, with Ratzinger. I jumped up and down, screaming. In yeah. joy. I think, with, I think with I've gotten to the point now where I get down on my knees. <laughs> you know. Well, I I almost went off the road. I heard it, you know, on the radio. Okay. I I have been when uh, ABC called me and said, "We gotta get out of the studio right away." They've got white smoke, and you know, I'm like. And, the, and then I've got the radio on, right? And then they, they gave the name just before I got to the studio. Right. And said, you know, Carlo Ratzinger. I started singing the Non Nobis Domine, yeah. you know, from uh, Henry V. That's, yeah, right, I, right. right. I, 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 it was what a wonderful day. But at any rate, uh, no, the, the, uh, what I would suggest the next Pope do, if he's Seurat or Burke, or seepage, or Tobin, any of these guys, if they're serious about being Pope and saving souls, the first thing they have to understand is that in church and state and everywhere, what the world needs and lacks is leadership. That's the first thing. We need a steady voice, not one that's explaining his own views, but that is grounded firmly in the truths that he's inherited and speaks not with his voice, but with the voice of his, of his predecessors and specifically the voice of, who's, of whom he is vicar. And I, I think that using the tiara, having a coronation, would be the first step in asserting the papacy. And there'll be... There will be. 
but not for long. Because that's something Benedict discovered as he started bringing stuff back. You know, the, the, the red shoes, everybody made fun of them. Oh, they're from Prada. Ha, ha, ha. But it was reminded, people were reminded that the Pope's shoes are red because of the blood of the martyrs. Right. He brought back the fur, you know, and, and all this sort of thing. Again, because it was about the office. It was about Benedict XVI, not Joseph Ratzinger. I, I personally would love for the next pope to mostly be silent. <laughs> what I mean by that is we don't need to know his opinions about anything because none right. of those really matter. And honestly, they don't really amount to anything more than my opinion or your opinion or anybody's opinions. If he just would just simply restate Catholic teaching and just stick with that. If he if he quoted see the the one of the keys to realizing the difficulties today, if you pick up any papal document from seventeen fifty to the present, look at the footnotes. Yeah. Uh not just this pontificate, but very, very much this pontificate. Time and again you'll have quotations from himself. Yes. We don't need that. We need the we need the fathers and doctors quoted. We need the councils quoted. Uh, I mean, we need well, one of the things that Benedict did that I really really liked were his uh, Wednesday audiences, where he'd go on these long teacher thoughts. You know, he did first he did the books of the Bible, then he went father of the church by father of the church, then he went through the doctors, and then he resigned. But that kind of teaching, maybe not specifically that way. Maybe an exploration of the four creeds. You know, most people know there are two. They don't know the last two. I, I mean, a bully pulpit to explicate the faith. Right. And without trying to explain it away or, well, you know, we don't have to. <laughs> Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you shall have life in you. Unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he shall enter the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't need explanation. Right. It needs repetition. We've had we've had two millennia of explanation. And you can find it anywhere you want, from St. Thomas to St. Bonaventure to St. Augustine. I mean, we've got all kinds of explication. What we don't have today is the dogma of the faith itself preached at the highest levels of the church. And that's what, I mean, we're in a crisis right now, partially because most Catholics don't know the dogma no. of faith. But we actually have a need for it. It's not like all, we're a bunch of well-catechized people who now we can talk about our opinions about climate change or whatever. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> let's stick to just the basics that, okay, people don't even know what the Trinity is. I mean, people don't know what, like you said, like baptism, what it means, or the Eucharist. And as we know, 70% don't, in America, at least, don't even believe in the real presence. And so no. just go back uh, one to the of, One of the most pathetic moments in American Catholic history, anyway, was reached when uh, Barack Obama became the primary teacher on the church's uh, teaching on contraception. Yeah. He was against it. But he knew enough about it to talk about it. Yeah. He'd read Humanae Vitae. Boy, that that puts him way up above most clerics. Woo! So I got a story about who I want to be the next pope. I I um I was doing interviews, around interviews for my last book, Deadly Indifference. And I was uh, this nun, I can't remember her name. She she worked at a, a like I think in the New York school system, just a regular nun, nothing. Um, you know, she wasn't like some traditional nun or anything like that, or a liberal nun, just a regular nun. And she's interviewing me, and she was saying how she liked the the Ford. That's always an interesting thing to say to an author because it's like you like the Ford probably better than the actual book yeah. the written by somebody else. But the Ford was written by Bishop Anthony Schneider, and she goes, "I really like him. You know, I'm going to pray for him to become the next Pope." And I just cracked up because she had no idea who he was. She had never heard him before. She saw the Ford in my book, and so I was like. Okay, we got some nun in New York who's praying for Bishop Snyder to be the next pope. I'm going to just go double down on that and say, yeah, that's that's what I'm going to pray for as well. I realize 
picking a non-cardinal has not happened, and I don't know how long. And the likelihood of him being the one is – I mean, the, the chances humanly are zero. But I'm going to go ahead and pray for it because I tell you what, that would – that he would bring back, I'm sure, a lot of the, the, oh, yeah. the things that you're talking about, but also he would stick to. In fact, I'm going to say it here, it's not a huge public announcement yet, but it will be soon after this goes live, is that Sophia Institute is publishing a catechism written by Bishop Schneider. Oh, excellent. And it is X. I have it. I can see it right now. It's in the office. I have a copy of it. It is excellent, but it's exactly what we're talking about sticking to okay here's what the church believes but it also addresses new con- controversies like the transgenderism stuff like that because we do have to address this but it does it oh. by just simply restating what the church has always believed not uh, yeah. new theories or anything like that so it's it's wonderful so that's my vote uh when, when they ask me as you know they will when the conclave calls me up and says eric hey who do you think we should vote for that's who I'm going to put my pitch in for, Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Here, you heard it here first. <laughs> well, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> yeah, and that's the only way it's happening. <laughs> yeah, <I was> gonna <laughs> say. the direct intervention. Then we'll, you know, how people falsely think that the Holy Spirit picks the next pope, and we're like, no, that's not how it works. Well, if Bishop Athanasius Schneider became the next pope, then I would say the Holy Spirit picked him because that's the only way that's happening. <laughs> well, uh, you know, the 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 thing you got to bear in mind is that when you say the po- the holy spirit picks them it's not it's not as though you know he uh, they, they they put the names out on the plate and he grabs one of them and there it is but there is a sense however in which we get the pope we either need or deserve mm-hmm. and one thing you got to remember when you're looking at our current holy father and his predecessors and his successes, for that matter, when they come along. Do we deserve better? Right. And that, and I, again, I don't want to be gaslighting, but, you know, part of the problem of writing... He of this church. I mean, he was formed and developed by this by the church we're in. So, no. you were just saying, he's 1968 still. Well, 1968 was, that happened. That's... And so you have to, we have to live with the consequences of it. Yeah. And I, one of the things about, you know, writing about Charles and Zita uh, with the background of Central Europe as it is today and as it's been for over a century. When I look at current political leadership, even even with Sleepy Joe, I think, gosh, you know, the horrible, the disgusting of this. Well, yeah, but, you know, once upon a time, we had a couple of saints upon a throne. And how do we treat them? How did their loyal subjects and their 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 governments deal with them? Well, I, one of the um, one of the telling realities of, of history is back in 1905, nine years before the war began, Kaiser Wilhelm II and Tsar Nicholas II, who were cousins, you know, they were first cousins. They went for a cruise together on the Baltic. And when they finished, they were in Helsinki, in Finland, which was Russian then, Russian territory. And they signed a peace treaty, a, a, treaty, a treaty of peace and alliance between Germany and Russia, uh, which was to take effect as soon as the Russo-Japanese War, which was waging then, ended. Uh, that Russia would endeavor to get France to join. And then they went back to their capitals. And both of their governments immediately denounced it. Hmm. Both the Russian and the German prime minister telling their sovereign, uh, if you don't withdraw this, I'm resigning. And so they they did. So that's what we have. You know, we the the ruled by the brightest and the best the political classes could possibly produce. Um. Yeah, that's how we end up where we are. Yeah. Of course, the, 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 the sad thing, really, more than anything else, of course, is that we're likely to give even even more of the same to our, uh, to our successors. Yes, that's true. 
However, I do have good news for you. Actually, I actually have two pieces of good news. Not related to the topic, but you might find them amusing. Okay, good. Uh, and we'll can... well, let's hear some good news to finish it off here. All right, all right. The first is an old, an old joke of mine during COVID was that when they had us put on our masks, they took theirs off. Yes. So that's, you know, just a little thing to throw out there. That's but true. I have learned a whole new word this past week. I never knew it before. And you'll appreciate this being involved with publishing, I think. You know, if you live in L.A. or if you're from L.A., you go to a movie, you'll sit through all the credits and watch them, and watch them because you very often know people. And I, I remember going to a movie in the Midwest a few years ago, and I did the same thing. And when the whole thing was over, I looked, there's this one couple left in the theater. So I went over to them, and I said, say, you guys from L.A.? And they looked at me, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> how indeed. Well, similarly, you know what you were saying, how authors will always read the foreword. We also read the acknowledgments. Right. Well, I just read a novel, and the author <laughs> thanked the sensitivity readers at his publisher. Now, I didn't know what a sensitivity reader was. <laughs> But fortunately, Wikipedia is a source of all truth. <laughs> it, it, it showed it is a thing. And sensitivity readers are the people who make sure that if there's a character or more who are characters of color, that nothing offensive or triggering or, or bad is in there. We used to call those censors when I was a kid. Right. Just like we call the people that are now equity officers in my day, we called them political commissars. Right. So the thing to bear in mind is that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, let's end it there. What we want to do is obviously pray for the, I actually I've gotten a habit. My my pastor mentioned that we need to pray for our bishop, but also for oh. the next bishop. And I think that's a good habit for obviously pray for your bishop, the next bishop, but also pray for the pope and the next pope. The next Pope is alive. He is active right now. He is doing something. And so we should be praying for him uh, yeah. right now that it will be somebody, like you said, who actually cares about saving souls. And, and we have to pray. Remember one thing. Any Pope like that is immediately going to be opposed by the great ones of this world. Yes. So we also have to pray for the courage of the Catholic people around the globe to back him up. Right. To get into a fight with China straight away. Likely to get into a fight with the United States, yep. Russia. I mean, you realize there's not a major government on the globe today that means well by the Catholic Church. Not one. Yeah. Not a single one. So for a pope, and this is, you know, when we look at, at the Holy Father and we say, oh, he's such a, you know, a, he surrenders and all. Stop and think. A pope who didn't do that would be like Pius IX, basically fighting with virtually every major government of his time. It takes guts of steel to be able to do that. And how many of us have them? Right. That's why I told you I'd resign first thing. <laughs> You know, Mark Coulomb didn't raise no moron. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one thing to remember, that we should also pray for ourselves so we have the guts to back him up. Yes, that's a great point. Yep, because he will, if, if we get a Pope who actually wants to do his job well, that will mean he is attacked and hated. And so yep. we have to be willing to, and we will be attacked and hated then, therefore, for supporting him. Supporting him, as will our bishops, as will our priests, as will our sisters. And the way they'll attack us, at this moment, we can't predict it. Right. But it'll be something unusual, something unexpected. Yes, absolutely. They'll get us in ways, you know, unless you subscribe to this, you're, uh, you you don't get a huge uh, cut off your income tax. Right. You know, some weird deal that you've never heard of before. Yeah. That's, that's what they'll do to us. Um, but, you know, what the hey. What matters is saving our souls. Uh, none of us get out of here alive, in the words of that great uh, theologian, Jim Morrison. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay, Charles, I appreciate this. This has been a great discussion. Um, and I just let's just keep praying. 
That's all we can do. Okay, until next time, everybody. God love you.